Today's podcast is sponsored by Slaughter and Sons Undertakers. Suitable whether you've been fried by dragon breath, nibbled by piranhas, immersed in acid, or pincushioned by goblin arrows. Special deals are available for mummification, Viking funerals, burial at sea, and other assorted death rituals. This week only, Slaughter and Sons also has a buy one, get one free offer in the event that you have an elderly or just slightly annoying relative who you'd like to, you know, just dispose of. Just quote the promotional code, Slaughter My Relatives, when making your booking. Give your loved ones the send-off they deserve at Slaughter and Sons. Hello, 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 and welcome to Morris's unofficial tabletop RPG talk. I am Russ, a.k.a. Morris, and with me here today is... Hi, I'm Peter Coffey. I'm here from the Southampton Guild of Role Players, broadcasting in live today from Edinburgh. Yeah, normally we do this in the same room. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but today, um, where, where are you? You're in Edinburgh. What are you doing in Edinburgh? I'm in Edinburgh for the Comedy Fringe Festival and also to visit my wife's parents. Wow. <laughs> have you, so have you, have you seen any good comedy up there? Uh, yeah, I've seen quite a few bits of good comedy. I've seen uh, all sorts of stuff. In fact, one of the things caught my eye was a mm. comedy-themed D&D-related show. Oh, well, should we I launch think... into that then? Tell me more. I think we should, yeah. It's called Questing Time, which is like Question Time, but with more of a quest. And it's uh, done by a chap called Paul Foxcroft, who's got ah. comedians of various stripes in, people like Nish Kumar. Last night, he had uh, Marcus Big Brickstock, who... Oh, right. So you're actually proper famous comedians, yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah. A- a- actual proper people, yeah. And what it is, is these comedians are playing D&D. Wow. I know. It's exactly... So we're actually playing D&D? They're actually playing d and it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's like a... So it's sort, of like, it's sort of like Critical Role, is it? Or... Yes, if Critical Role didn't have voice actors... And had comedians. Okay, fair um, enough. <laughs> like, yeah, they, they are trying to role play and so forth. And it's it's like it's a game of D and D. It is done in an hour, so it's yeah. like a bit condensed. But yeah, it, it's fantastic. And there's sort of a certain amount of audience participation. For instance, if we're all going bananas when someone says something, they tend to yeah. get advantage on the roll. <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really. I, I, had no, I had no idea this thing existed. I know, me neither. It's like, I looked at the thing, I was like, huh, that seems like it could be a thing. Went along to it, it was completely packed out. Mind you, it was done in a shipping container. You know one of those okay. 20 ton equivalent units? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was in one of those, but with seats. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, Critical Role's coming to the UK soon. No, get out. October, I believe it is. It's Ooh. one of the sort of London, I think it's one of the London Comic Con Oh, fantastic. Um, events or something like that. Yeah, that'd be But they'll amazing. be over in London later this year. Brilliant. I definitely, definitely plan to go to that, without a doubt. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We should both go. It'd be great. Well, it might be my only opportunity to get to see them, given the, yes. you know, size of the pond and all that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Questing Time is actually also in London. It's like every second Sunday at a pub called The Phoenix, which is the home to um, absolutely tons and tons of improv. But as I say, currently they're up in Edinburgh doing with you know, some fairly seriously big name comedians wow. in the UK. And that's uh, 11 o'clock at Pleasance This. Uh, I, I enjoy a bit of good improv, a bit of good DMing, and it was all, all, all of those. So, good times. Fantastic. What caught your eye this week? So, do you remember a few weeks ago, we yep. talked about a special edition of uh, Waterdeep Dragon Heist by a company called Beadle and Grimm? Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they wanted... Was it something like $500, but they couldn't actually tell you what was in the box? Correct, yes. <laughs> yeah. So this is yeah. So this is a box set. It's, they call it the Platinum Edition of um, Waterdeep Dragon Heist, which, as you know, is the adventure coming out from Wizards of the Coast later this year for D&D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, at the time, they, they had it up for pre-order, $500, <laughs> which is a lot of money, especially I'm given sure the fact that it. at the time, they couldn't tell you what was going to be in the box. Like, I remember, because they could tell you, this is things that are like what's in the box. Mm. There's not what's in the box. Can't tell what's in the box. <laughs> it was a brave stance, I thought. But anyway, we now know what no. is in that box. Oh. Because at Gen Con this last week, That's... they uh, they opened the box and showed us. Oh, fantastic. 
Uh, so I have it up here. I've seen. I've got some photos up in front of me, and I've got a list here. So this is this is what's in the box. This is what you get for your five hundred dollars, and it oh. is gorgeous looking stuff. Oh. Um, so uh, the Waterdeep Dragon Heist book itself is broken nice. down into eight smaller books. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, uh, there's also a whole bunch of sort of handouts which include like all the important maps, mm. uh, all the major artwork. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a custom DM screen which oh. also includes an NPC tracker. Oh, okay. Uh, mm. There's 22 miniatures, Oof. two large ones and 20 regular sized ones. Mm. Uh, mm. One of them including a, a unique beholder. Oh, wow. There's a whole range of battle maps that you mm. can put down to put your miniatures on. Uh -huh. There's a stack of encounter cards, which basically they um, they hook over your uh, DM screen. And on uh -huh. one side, facing the players, there's an image of the creature. And yep. on the side facing you, there's the stats of the creature. Oh, nice. That is quite cool. A um, yeah. bunch of custom handouts. There's letters, journals, even sort of water deep newspapers and stuff that you can, well, fragments of that you can hand out. There's two really gorgeous large canvas maps. Uh, one is of Waterdeep. Oh. Now, the other one, I don't know what it is. Um, and uh, apparently it's been kind of kept secret for some reason. My suspicion is because there's a sort of spoiler for the oh. adventure. And the adventure obviously hasn't been released yet, properly. Oh. So I'm, I'm guessing that the other's a map that they just don't want to stick the identity of out in public right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, and also you get a dragon coin, which is a sort of gold coin. Uh, <laughs> okay. Does it have um, a dragon some, on? Some things called faction objects, which are kind of like badges or pins or, or buttons or what, you know. Yes, yeah, you will have just, like uh, dual pins for the Harpers, center in. Yeah, that sort of thing. thing. Yeah, oh. yeah. Uh, nice, uh, nice. A visitor's guide to the City of Splendors from Volo. <laughs> that will be entertaining, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. so for $500, it's still... It's still expensive, but it certainly sounds better than it did a few weeks ago. Yes, yes. It, it, you can definitely say, have a look at it and say, that is what I want or what I don't want. <laughs> I think it's still probably beyond my budget, but I reckon there's oh. some collectors out there that would love that. Oh, yeah. It definitely sounds like a premium value for collectors. Uh, and obviously we'll be putting that in the show notes so people can have a look if they like. Yeah, absolutely. Ooh. Okay, then. Shall we do the news? Yes, let's. What's the big news? Well, the biggest news, of course, is the Any Award winners. Yes, yes. So we covered the nominees in detail a couple of weeks ago. We so did. So we don't have to go into quite so much detail this time. But the uh, Ennies took place in a glittering ceremony on Friday night at Gen Con. Mm -hmm. It was hosted by Andy Hopp. Um, mm -hmm. There were guest presenters, including Stacey uh, Delafano, um, who is one of the founders of Contessa. Oh, OK, yeah. Uh, there's BJ Hensley from Lone Wolf Development. Uh, Mark Morrison of Campaign Coins, and uh, Amanda Valentine, who worked on things like masks and bubblegum shoe and stuff like that. Right. Uh, she's nice. she's um, been a guest presenter at the um, Ennies a few times, actually. She was the host Ooh. one year. Uh, so was Stacey, for that matter. Ooh. So, yeah, so congratulations. Go out to this year's group of, you know, any winning writers and artists and designers and so forth. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, Darker Hue Studios, uh, they did very well with Harlem Bound because we called those out, didn't we? Mm, yes, we did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they got best setting and best writing. So mm -hmm. uh, Chris Spivy, Ruth Tillman, Bob Guy, Sarah Hood and uh, Neil Raymond Price will be very happy. And best cover art for Sam Lamont. So that's, uh, you know, covering themselves in glory. Fantastic. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, and who, who else did we have? We had uh, Arc Dream Publishing's Delta Green. So, so Delta, uh, Delta Green did very, very well this year. I think, this, I think that was well, one of, that was possibly the biggest winner of the year with the number of awards. Oh, hard to say. Best ebook, best production values, best rules. Yeah. Uh, who do we have? Dennis De Twiller, Adam Scott Glancy, uh, Christopher Gunning, Kenneth Height, Shane Ivey, and Greg Stoltz. They must be very, very pleased. Tell you one that was a bit of a surprise, a bit of a mm. dark horse. Mm -hmm. Zweihander. I know. Best game and. It got product Best of the year. Product. I, I, I know. I, what? I, I was I, not seeing that coming. Well, I, I'd heard it was very good, but Daniel D. Fox must have been doing like a major fist bump that day. Cause, I like, guess so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I, yeah took, took me by surprise that one. Was not expecting that. Yeah. Um, what, what, what else do we have? We have... Oh, um, a surprise one for me was uh, Blades in the Dark picked up gold for best website. Amazing rando design, but nothing else. 
Oh, the uh, SRD website. Yes, yes, I'm yes, right, yeah. yes, yeah. Medivius didn't do too badly. They scooped up three silvers and uh, got a gold star for uh, Star Trek Minis. Gold star. They got gold for Star Trek Minis. <laughs> but they got a gold star as a gold, well. A gold Good work. <laughs> <laughs> do, do it. I'll, I'll do, yeah, well, all four of they got, they got a gold take. star and a pat on the head. No. <laughs> yeah. Well done, Methicus. Well done. <laughs> yes, they, uh, they got a gold any for their Star Trek miniatures and a couple of silvers for a couple of other things. Um, RuneQuest, best free product to quick start rules and adventure. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Um, fans' choice for best publisher... Not too surprising, Wizards of the Coast. Yes, although that did surprise me a little bit as they hadn't actually bothered entering anything this year, which must have been a terrible shame because that means that we weren't able to reward their design teams with what they deserved, which was like well, public recognition. Yeah. Uh, the D&D Adventurers League also pulled in a gold any for Lost Tales of Mithranor. Yes, yes, that was a, that was a solid one. Uh, good to see organised play doing well. I was surprised that Peso, six entries, no wins. That, that is possibly the first time that has ever happened. Mm, mm. But they, I think we're seeing a trend, though, at the moment with the Annies, and I've kind of noticed this over the last year or two, uh-huh. is that some of the smaller publishers, especially sort of the one- or two-man bands, or the, mm. you know, the, the much, much smaller ones, are yeah. campaigning much, much harder for... Um, okay, they want the visibility. For, for, for votes, yeah. Um, so mm. they're, you know, they're doing a... I mean, uh, for Zweihander, for example, he, yes. um, he he campaigned all across the internet. He made a video, a campaign video. Really? Basically, he, you know, he tried really, really hard to get those votes. So I think he, you know, he oh, worked amazing. for them. Absolutely. Um, and I think we're seeing a trend that some of the smaller publishers are starting to really sort of realise if they do campaign really hard, mm-hmm. they can actually... Yeah, they are in a chance, with a chance of sort of like being up there with the big boys. Absolutely, yeah. And I think this um, year has shown that that strategy working. Yeah. Um. Uh, uh, who else do we have? Uh, Pelgrain Press, Monty Cook. Neither of them picked up anything. They had five no. entries between them. Green Ronin. I thought they didn't. They hadn't won anything, which was surprised because they had Taldoray and. No, they, did, they, they, they did get a silver for best cover on yeah, um, Taldoray. And uh, well deserved too. All, all, all in all, it was a fantastic showing with a lot of small publishers making the effort. Uh, silver for fan favourite, I think, went to Chaosium. Uh, yes, mm. Chaosium, of course, did very, very well. I mean, yeah. Chaosium over the last few years have been doing very well at the end. He's full stop. Yes. Um, no. Right, yeah, so I, I'm not sure how many they got. They got a good handful of awards there, though. They got Best yeah, Family um, Product with Kind of Calms. Yes, um, they've got the Rune Quest, which I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else? Uh, we've got um, doo, 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 Reign of Terror, best supplement. Mm. Yeah. Um, we've got a silver for Down Darker Trails for best monster or adversary product. They they definitely they definitely uh, taken a shot at it. Yeah. I believe. Okay, so um, but should we have a look at the rest of the news then for the week? Mm. Yes. What's a uh, uh, so on uh, Amazon and uh, WizKids site has appeared. Um, what's 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 your sort of upper end for paying for a miniature? Would you say? Oh, um, well, if it's like tw- so, assuming twenty eight mil scale and like basically person sized, I probably wouldn't pay more than nine ten pounds. Okay, well, this is not person sized. This oh, okay. is a thirty three inch colossal model of a sailing ship as part of their Icons of the Realm series. Oh my god, And it wow. is gorgeous. <laughs> oh, that sounds fantastic. Do you know how much yeah. it costs? No idea. 250 of your American dollars. Oh, that's reasonable. It's to not be cheap. For, 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 um, is, it, does it come, is it a kit you have to put together then? Sort of. So it's 17 inches tall, 33 inches long, um... Six and a half inches wide, but wider where the masts stick out. As I said, two hundred and fifty dollars. So basically, you get a whole bunch of kind of like um, reversible deck plates, which you can turn over with or without grids, and the masts are kind of magnetized to stand in place and things like that. So it's got a bunch of sort of like movable bits, stackable deck tiles, removable staircases, even functional hatches and things. Oh, that sounds amazing! What well, well, is well, quite well, gorgeous. What website is this on? Um, so you can find that at WizKids. We'll put it in the show notes, of course. Oh, and fact, uh, it's on Amazon as well. It's called the Falling Star Sailing Ship. I just found it on the front page of Finworld. Oh, that is, that is a it's bit lovely, right. isn't it? So other big oh. news. 
Mm, yes. Pathfinder 2 playtest has finally been launched. Yes, that was at Gen Con as well, wasn't it? How's yes, that it go? Was. Well, well, obviously I wasn't there, but from the sounds of it, it was a colossally successful launch. Um, you could pick up copies of the hardcover, hardcover, yes, hardcover mm. book there. There's a, it's a little bit of sadness with this, unfortunately, because oh. the people who pre-ordered the books, yes, there's been a delay with Amazon who are handling the distribution, and they yeah. haven't gotten their books yet, and as yet, there's there's no date as to when they will. So really? people at Gen Con, it appears, are getting the books before people who actually pre-ordered, which is a little disappointing. I mean, you know, it's nobody's fault. It happens. Yeah. Uh, um, and the PDF is available for free, so you can grab that right now. Fantastic. Um, so, yeah, so that launched at Gen Con. Um, there's also some details on the sort of uh, playtest adventures that go with it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Obviously, the way they do... Because this is a playtest um, book. It's not the actual final book. The way the way they do that is they released uh, a series of adventures, each mm. of which will be available for a sort of few weeks at a time, and then mm. use those adventures specifically to sort of direct feedback towards specific areas of the rules and ask specific questions about um, player experience with those rules. So we don't mm. know a lot about these, but we do know that the first one was made available yeah. at Gen Con. And mm-hmm. will be available online from August the 7th. So the first one is called The Lost Star. The Lost Star. So yeah. there's seven chapters, basically. That'll be available until August the 26th. Mm-hmm. That'll be followed by Pale Mountain's Shadow. Okay. A fair at Somberfell Hall. The Mirrored Moon. Mm-hmm. The Heroes of Undarin. Mm-hmm. Red Flags. And When the Stars Go Dark, which will be be. That'll be the final one on November the 5th through to November the 18th. Yeah, have to have a listen to that. That'll be very good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yep, that's that's the Pathfinder playtest. Uh, you can go to Peso's site now. You can download the document. Um, I don't think the hard copies are now available. I think mm. you had to pre-order those. Uh, yeah. So if you pre-ordered it, hopefully it'll be arriving sometime soon. If you're at Gen Con, perhaps you picked one up. In other news, Diana Jones mm. Awards. Yes, yes. I took place last Wednesday night. Those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the winner of this year's award went to the concept of actual play. So rather than a specific person, this is uh, awarding like all those people who live stream, podcast, um, and you know, sort of uh, distribute their sort of actual play game sessions. They said um, that the overall movement of recording and broadcasting game sessions has done more to popularize role playing games than anything since the satanic panic of the 1980s, and in a far more positive way. Legit. People aren't playing it because they they want to rebel. They're playing it because they've looked at it online and they've said, that is awesome, i got to get me some of that. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, that was up against, um, there's um, five nominees every year. I think we mentioned this in a previous mm. episode, but the, the other, the other uh, nominees were the uh, 200 Word RPG Challenge, Analog yes. Game Studios, Charterstone, and Harlem Unbound. Yeah, yeah. A uh, strong competition. Yeah. But yeah, I can see how a concept... Well, it's, it's the Diana Jones for you, isn't it? It's like, yeah. They're, uh, they, they've got their own thing going, and rightly so. Yeah. Uh, what else is there in the news? We have got some more information about the general RPG market. Oh, yes, yes. ICV2 um, yeah. releases its uh, quarterly top five role-playing games. So spring 2018, D&D, still got the top spot, unsurprisingly. Mm. Right, Starfinder is outpacing yes. Pathfinder yes, still. Yes, it is. Yes. Possibly for a couple of reasons. One, because Starfinder is still relatively new, and partly because I think maybe some people are waiting on Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And don't forget the acceleration, the better acceleration they get from having spaceships. Oh, there's that, of course, yes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, you got man, what can you say? Yeah, yeah. And then the Fantasy Flight games have spots number four and five. Mm, um, yes. With the Star Wars RPG at number four, mm-hmm. and yeah. number five is their Genesis generic game system. Yes. Which yes, is the same a... game system as the Star, Star Wars RPG, isn't it? Or very similar uh, to. Oh, uh, exactly, exactly. It's the, the, the genericized version. But yeah, it's um, very good. It's like a hitting the storytelling and dice rolling sort of sections at the same yeah. time, which is a very strong way to go about it. Lots, so of, the, lots of ways to expand your game. So the entire market has expanded up to $1.55 billion. That's the North American market. Uh, yeah, that good. is um, including the role-playing game segment, which has gone from 45 to $55 million. Wow, nice. So that's a 22% increase over the last year. 
Mm-hmm. And bear in mind, in 2013, the role-playing games North American market was $15 million. Oh. It's now 55 <laughs> Wow, okay. So that's, uh, what, tripled, nearly quadrupled in size? Over exactly. It's then? enormous. Yeah. It's enormous. Um, it's, it's interesting oh. also that all of the segments uh, increased this year, miniatures, board games, card and dice games, role-playing games, except for one. Oh. And this is the first time there's been a decrease in quite a number of years in any of these segments, and that's collectible mm. games. So we're talking things like Magic the Gathering and all that sort of thing. Right, right, right. That okay, dropped yeah. by 3% this year for the first time in a long, long, long time. Oh, okay. Interesting. Hmm. So that makes well, well, of course, uh, the uh, miniatures market, yeah. which is we're talking your Warhammer 40Ks here and stuff mm. like that, dwarfs both of those massively. Yes. I mean, that is so big in comparison that, you know, d and is not even a blip in the ocean of that. No, it's just, no. just, just a miniature. <laughs> I mean, like market size, I mean, as in terms of dollars but that's partly because the hobby the miniatures hobby is so expensive as well yes yes um like and I, i've never seen the part price so that massively skews the figures no, of course. but it, it's interesting we'll have to see if that persists um it might well not um wow. what's interesting also is that uh on kickstarter um in uh, the first six months of 2018 yeah um, this year tabletop games that's including board games card games and rpgs mm-hmm. um mainly board games, to be fair, because then mm. they make a lot of money on Kickstarter, have yes. raised uh, almost $80 million in total on Kickstarter <laughs> alone, representing, oh. get this, yeah. 30% of everything Kickstarter did in that time period. Wow. That's astonishing. Tabletop game is, games are so important to Kickstarter at the moment. I'm I'm actually just sat here. Gusted, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What? So, like, what, 30% was, what, uh, collect, uh, what, what, the actual collectible uh, So, it's all, t- it's all tabletop games, so board games, card games, and role-playing games. $80 right, million, right. Dollars, which is 30% of everything done on Kickstarter during that time period. Wow, that's, that's, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have guessed, but there you go. That's the, that's the sort of insight the figures don't analysis. Lie. That, that's the sort of insightful analysis people listen to us for. Me sat there going... <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> no, that's amazing. I mean, it, it's a uh, very interesting. I think part of the reason might be is a lot of products you can buy, you can get them on Kickstarter, and then almost before the Kickstarter's finished, you're able to buy them from China mm. for cheaper, because a lot of these things can just be straight up, uh, not, admit- not so much counterfeited, but like yeah. just made. Well, also, I mean, I've got a bit of a bugbear with this mm. sort of practice. Sometimes on Kickstarter, you see things mm. going on sale before it's made available to backers of the Kickstarter, oh, which what? I find frustrating. Oh no, that's 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 so far from 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 on. It's like it's it's all the way over there. Mm. It's like so so not on. Goodness, I mean, yeah, I obviously creators have to make money. That's pretty important. It's why people become creators in many ways. It's like. You know, get paid for doing what you love, and they have to get paid. They've got bills to pay, but yeah, wow. Um, selling people stuff before like you've actually fulfilled your promises—that that's that's not a good way to do business. Mm. I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. No, nobody likes salespeople who don't keep their promises. Yeah, I mean that's why that's why um, when I run Kickstarters, mm. we have this policy at EN Publishing that um, mm. we do not promise anything in the Kickstarter, even in a stretch goal, mm. um, that we haven't already made yes so basically the kickstarter ends we can send it out and we can move on we're not no. going to be there a year later while people are still going wait where are our books where are our books my stuff where is it yeah <laughs> um you know we everything that's on a on the kickstarter page that we that we run exists mm-hmm. already and no it's, it's good i mean I, I do sort of enjoy the speculation of Kickstarter. Like, oh, we've got stretch goals. So many stretch goals. Just yeah. think of what you can get. Oh, ab- absolutely. Uh, yeah, a bit right. more news, if you want to hear oh, it. Okay. Love to. What's Ooh. up? Uh, Eberron and Adventurers League. I'm listening. So, as you know, Eberron appeared on the DMs Guild. Yes, um, yes. Wayfinder's Guide. Starting September 21st, mm-hmm. um, Eberron is coming to the Adventurers League with the uh, Embers of the Last War campaign. Oh, really? Yes, um, it starts with uh, What's Past is Prologue, an adventure for zero-level characters who will be retired at the end of that adventure and then new first-level characters created for the next 11 adventures. 
And uh, the campaign uses the new rules from the Wayfarer's Guide to Eberron, which is available now, um, and can be used alongside the adventures published in Encounters at Sharn, which is also soon to be available for Adventure League play. Interesting. Because the whole thing about Adventures League, as you know, is that Mm. you're supposed to be able to create a character, play that character at any table using Adventures League rules. Mm. Uh, You've got a log of your experience points, gold and magic items. You can then go anywhere else that you want. So I, as someone who is organising and running Adventures League, Mm -hmm. am now thinking, does this mean that as of October, I might have people turning up saying, oh, this this is my uh, magic musket that I've acquired in Eberron. I'm like, hmm, yes. Forgotten Realms. Do you know? I don't Forgotten know. Realms. I do not know how okay. Adventurers League handles different settings. Well, it's not, it doesn't. It's got Forgotten Realms uh, with like sort of maybe-ish Ravenloft. Well, this is going to be new then, isn't it? I'm sure, I'm sure there'll be information out by then to, yeah. to tell you how to handle it. I, I'm sure it will be fine and nothing can possibly go wrong. I would <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that might be it for the big news of the week. Unless there's Ooh. anything else that caught your eye. Uh, yeah, I mean, the only thing which is going to be not huge of interest to a lot of people is they've revised the Adventures League rules. So it's now you've got a bigger reward for role-playing mm. rather than necessarily competing events. Oh, yeah, I do believe I saw something about that. I didn't, because I, I don't play an Adventures League myself, no. so I didn't really read it in detail myself but yeah so um that's a good it's like, like a complete overhaul is that yes yes it's a uh, move to sort of milestone xp right so time spent playing is now of equal value so if your party is role playing being in the pub mm. they get the same xp and eventually gold has people who have done the adventure so as someone who is involved with the adventures league how do you feel about that uh, i uh try to stay positive about such things because you know what gamers are like mm. your light bulb goes you need one gamer to change it and 49 to say they like the old light bulb better but you know ultimately i play adventures league because i like the compact story the high adventure and the high risk of it yeah because like you know you're playing level appropriate stuff but ideally the gm won't be fudging the dice they'll be like yeah Dice for where they may. Um, best of luck to you. And if I rolled four twenties in a roll, that's really more your problem <laughs> rather than my problem. Which, which, in many ways, I love because it's like it's a it's a bit of a it's more welcoming to new players mm. because you do not need to know how to play. But also, it's like I don't know. It's just like a, it feels it feels a bit riskier. It feels a bit more exciting for me personally than some of the home games can be. Before we finish the news, quickly, mm-hmm. um, yes, just yes. one last thing. I just spotted. Are you familiar with Green Warren's Freeport City of Adventure setting? I'm not, but that sounds based on the title. Exactly. <laughs> <Can you guess>? <laughs> <laughs> it, go on, it go on, go like... on. Let's do it. Let's do it. Can well, you Freeport... guess what Freeport City of Adventure is based on the title? <laughs> I love it. Let's mix and bash. Bash <laughs> Here we go. Uh, yeah. So Freeport City of Adventure. Well, it, a Freeport would be traditionally a place where one could like just rock up it doesn't owe fealty to anyone else it's basically mm-hmm. an independent city state mm-hmm. and free ports also speak very heavily to things like pirates mm-hmm. and like merchant shipping traveling along so it sounds like basically it's sort of a pirate town slash den of thieves basically moss Eisley, but with less wookies wow you get seven billion points out of seven well done <laughs> um, so yeah so Freeport dates back about 18 years uh, back okay, in the so early the... days of third edition, that's exactly what you got it exactly right. The early yeah, days yeah. of um, third edition, Green Running brought out their Freeport setting, which was, as oh. you say, a sort of like city state with you know pirates and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and it's been around ever since, going through various editions of D and D. I think possibly for some of their adventure game engine stuff and things like that. Um, currently, there's some um, some Pathfinder material for it too. So it's, it's it's a it's an old it's you know these I don't think I think of it as quite new but these it's, it's, it's I suppose it's an old setting. <laughs> there are people playing D and D today who were not alive when it came out. <laughs> when this came out, yeah, sure. Yeah, well, yeah, there's, yeah. there's certainly people playing D and D who weren't alive when D and D came out. But um, <laughs> oh yeah, well absolutely. Yes, yeah, so eighteen years ago, there's you know yeah. sixteen year olds playing D and D today who yeah. you know. Freeport's been around for longer than they have. But anyway, Ooh. so uh, Freeport, it's been around 
in sort of like book format for years. Popular yeah, setting yeah. from Green Ronin. Um, they are bringing out a video game. Ooh. But it's an interesting spin on this one because it's not your typical video game. It's a CRPG based in a virtual game room. So um, I've got a screenshot up here, which is basically, it looks like you're in some kind of attic or maybe pirate ship hold or something. And there's a table in the middle and there's chairs around it. And it's this virtual game room. Oh, um, yeah, so it's like lots of wood and like a yeah, yeah, big yeah, wooden yeah. table. Sort of sunlight streaming in through a sort of round window and that sort of thing. Uh, nice, nice, nice. Um, yeah. uh, a virtual GM. Ooh. Virtual dice, virtual miniatures, all this sort of stuff. Mm. It sounds like the virtual GM is a celebrity from the sounds of their press release. Um, uh, so, it's voiced by a celebrity. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's, there's a big announcement. It's based on a series called a series of six adventures called Return to Freeport, mm-hmm. um, which was released a few years ago for the Pathfinder RPG. I don't know what system yes. this is going to use. Possibly Pathfinder. Who knows? Or maybe not even. A, I don't know. Um, no. But the six part series of adventures, Pathfinder RPG, Return to Freeport. They say uh, so. The game takes place in a virtual world on a virtual tabletop. This will be this will be especially enhanced in VR. The table oh. is your play space. Um, there will be a backstage where you can walk around the town, and when you enter buildings, there will be a front stage that gives you a more sort of intimate and detailed look at the world you're occupying. Um, mm-hmm. You go through a process of picking the type of character you want to play. You open a pack of minis and paint them to create your avatar. <laughs> so it's basically a, a, not so much a walking simulator, but literally... A tabletop RPG simulator. It seems like it, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, seems... so it's, you're, you're playing. So you're playing. A, do you, do you, is this a multiplayer thing or like? Yeah, you yeah. Play on apparently, your own? apparently so. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, they say, uh, how incredible would it be to have a magic mm. table that comes to life as the GM describes what is happening? What if you could play a tabletop game with friends over the internet in VR? Wow. This does sound good. So the virtual game master, you play in this virtual room and uh, it's hosted by, as they said, a virtual game master. And it says uh, the voice of this game master will be familiar to tabletop fans everywhere. Who could that be? Oh. I mean, I, think, I can think of two immediate <laughs> candidates, but I'm sure there's more <laughs> candidates. But my two first guesses would be yeah. Matthew Mercer of Critical Role fame Fair enough. or Will yeah. Wheaton of tabletop fame. Ooh. And I know both of those have worked with Green Running before. Yes. So Ooh. they're two strong guesses, but, you know, it could be someone else. Who knows? Crikey. That, that would be, well, let's wait and see. I'm, well, it's too early for me to be excited, <laughs> but I'll be a bit excited anyway. Holiday 2019. Okay, well, keep our eyes out, see what happens. And now for another exciting section, everyone. Here we have the world-famous Dr. Victor von Wolfenhausen Smith. He needs no introduction, but we're going to do it anyway. He's climbed mountains, he's fought bears, he's arm-wrestled cougars, there's all sorts of things he's up to, and now, here in the studio today, Dr. Victor von Wolfhausen Smith. Um, yeah, so it was one of my more interesting travels. I remember mm. meeting a, a strange drow there. Uh, oh, yeah, what was his name now, young chap? J- j- Drizzit. Drizzit? Drizzit? Something like that. Bless you. Yes. <laughs> Why, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, so I, I taught him how to, uh, how to uh, use uh, two scimitars. Uh, As you know, I'm a champion sword fighter. Yes, indeed. Uh, your record at Munich has stood and run. For yes, indeed. Um, yeah, so I uh, explained to him exactly how to use these two scimitars. Yes. And uh, uh, yes, I believe he's actually quite well known. Um, he uses the uh, Wolfhausen Smythe stance, I believe. Yes, the, the, I think he's now gone for a mod- modified Wolfhausen Smythe stance because he lacks your upper body strength, so can't quite follow through as hard as you could. Well, if you had a beard like mine, it would be much easier. Well, that's from Dark Health, you see. Can't grow beards. Yes, yes. He did look about 12, to be fair. They often do. They often do. Hmm. Oh, sorry. Is it Dr. Wolfhausen Smythe or Dr. Von Wolfhausen Smythe? <laughs> Dr. Victor Von Wolfhausen Smythe. You I... know me from my best-selling series of novels. Have you read any of them? The Victor Von Wolfhausen Smythe Choose Your Own Adventure books. Of course, I grew up reading those things. Yes, New York Times bestsellers they were. Oh, absolutely. Every time a new one comes out, it the only thing to knock out the previous one off the top. 
best-selling number one slot. Yes, indeed. It is quite a burden, you know, being the world's best-selling author. And so modest, too. Well, I must tell the truth to my dear listeners and fans. Of course, it is hard to be as modest when you're as great as you are. Indeed, indeed. So, Dr. Victor von Wolfhausen's five, uh, tell me, do you have any more books in the pipeline? Oh, yes. I'm writing my 15th memoir. Your 15th memoir? Yes, this covers the time I visited the moon. The moon, really? Yes, yes. I decided I wanted to place a flag up there. Oh, interesting. Yes. Um, I, I suddenly hoped one day to go and stay there for a while. So I travelled up there in a, a small Russian craft. Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, so it is? Um, yes, bless you. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> yep. And uh, which, did you visit the dark side or just stick on the light side? Oh, the dark side, of course. It's a fantastic album as well. <laughs> Yes, I did advise Pink Floyd when they first created that uh, that uh, record. Oh, did you give them help with the cover art too? Oh, actually, I I did most of it, you know. Oh, I, mean, yeah, I, I, I let them keep the credit, but you know, I I composed the music and I played most of the instruments. At and, the same time, uh, wrote, what... I wrote the lyrics. I am a big fan of your one man band skills. <laughs> Uh, did you ever do any work with the Beatles? The Beatles? Well, let me tell you about the time when I met the Beatles. It was shortly after I climbed Mount Everest. You climbed Mount Everest? Yes, yes. I climbed Mount Everest with William Shakespeare, you know. With William Shakespeare? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, yes, on top of the mountain, we composed some of his greatest sonnets. Really? Yes, indeed. Uh, but anyway, I, I digress. Yeah, so you uh, wouldn't say you're the dark lady to whom he refers? Well, that would be telling. Well, indeed, indeed. Well, uh, we can't ask you to kiss and tell. That would be a different story altogether. <laughs> oh, no. I must admit, before he met me, he did not have a beard. Have you ever considered getting into freelance RPG writing? Uh, only in the loosest possible sense. I've created my own game settings and so forth, but actually writing that my style doesn't seem very compatible with um, how you would write RPG books. I expect we've got many listeners who might be interested in doing something like that. And so I thought we could talk a bit on sort of how to get into freelance writing for role-playing games, uh, what sort of money you can expect, the type of contracts, pitfalls, things like that. I mean, as you, as you okay. know, I've been publishing for about 20 years now. Yeah. So I'm, I think I've got a reasonably accumulated, a reasonable amount of knowledge about this topic. Well, you'd hope so now. Yes, and I've, you know, I've, I've employed many, many, many freelancers over my yeah. over my lifetime. So I'm more than happy to sort of like discuss this. And uh, I've written a couple of articles as well in the past. There was what's a freelance RPG writer worth and mm -hmm. what's an artist worth, both of which you can find on my website. Ooh. Let's start off with the basics. What is a freelancer? So a freelancer is somebody who works on a temporary basis, a contractor, essentially, for a... Oh. Uh, I, I am, we're just going to talk about this in the context of RPG publishers. So Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's fine, yeah. Temporary basis to uh, work for an RPG publisher to write anything as short as an article, mm -hmm. up as long as an entire hardcover book or more. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. Usually they're paid per word, not always, but usually they're paid mm -hmm. per word based mm -hmm. on a specific task and um, okay, yeah. will tend to write for various different companies, just taking mm -hmm. on various freelance jobs for them. Some freelancers eventually become sort of employees of um, tabletop RPG companies, but very few RPG companies actually use full-time employees. They usually use mm -hmm. freelancers almost exclusively. I certainly do. Uh, so, and freelancers can work for whoever will pay them basically yeah essentially they're not tied into anything yeah specific. yeah so okay. yeah so they're contractors basically they you know yeah. not dissimilar to say the plumber who comes down to sort of help you out or an electrician that you might hire they're someone you're going to hire out to come and do a specific I need, piece I need of work this for project them. completed yes exactly yeah okay one of one of the big things about freelance work and this is one that i any freelancer who ever asks me i always make this you know one of the first things i say to them is this Make sure you're being paid. Even yes. if this is your first ever piece of freelance work, your work mm. has value. You should not work for exposure. If anyone tells you that they're not going to pay you, but the exposure will look good or will look good on your CV or resume, anything like that, walk away. Don't do it. Yeah. Get paid. Even if you don't care about it yourself, even if you're a millionaire who's decided to slum it as a freelancer 
and decided to write a short article, get paid for it, because even if you don't need the money, you are part of a precedent. And there's a lot of freelancers out there that do need the money. And if, you know, not being paid is normalised, that might not affect you, know, you as a rich freelancer, of which there are very few, um, but it will certainly affect the many, 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 many freelancers who are not rich. Exactly. So who, get paid. This is their livelihood. Yeah. Yes. Get paid whether you need to or not. And you can certainly see that in things like um, volunteering. I mean, of course, volunteering is a separate thing. If you're volunteering mm. for, for, you know, a sort of community-based or charity type thing, that's mm. an entirely different kettle of fish. But we're talking about yeah. a basic commercial um, proposition. Yeah. Make okay, sure you so get paid. This is professional work needs to be paid. Yes, absolutely. Do not get okay. paid for exposure. If you know, if you're not being paid, you're probably being exploited. Right. So let's cut to the meat of the matter. What is the typical rates of pay for a freelancer? So there are three ways you can be paid. Number one, you can be paid a flat fee for a project. Simple, straightforward. You do a specific amount of work for a flat rate. Usually yeah. there'll be a word count attached to that. So they might say, right, this uh, adventure will pay you $500 to write or whatever. So yeah. that's, that's the first way. The second way is a, uh, and this is very common, is a uh, per word rate, which can vary. To be fair, the RPG, the RPG industry is not great at this, mainly mm -hmm. because most publishers are incredibly poor too. Yeah. You know, if you, if, the old, the old saying is, the old saying is, how do you make a million dollars in the RPG industry? <laughs> Start off with 10 million. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's not, it's not a, a line of work you go into to get rich. Yeah. That yeah, said, right. the RPG industry is notoriously low paying for it. Even at the top end of the RPG, sort of like the best pay rates you're going to get probably as a freelancer, probably around about sort of 10 cents a word. And that's probably if you're working for someone like Peso or Wizard of the Coast who can afford that. If you're mm -hmm. working for smaller companies, you're probably looking at five or six cents a word for the sort of more generous companies. Three, mm -hmm. cents, the word, three cents a word, I personally think is is about standard lower than that you do get companies that pay one cent half a cent a word obviously i personally oh. wouldn't go near that sort of pay rate i would certainly yeah. refuse to ever pay anyone less than three cents a word myself mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, just, yeah, I just won't perhaps. do it um so yeah i think you three cents a word are standard half a cent or one cent a word think carefully before you take that job doesn't mean don't take it yeah. you know there's a million reasons you might take it but think carefully so the third way you might get paid is royalties Ah, so royalties yeah. are when you get a percentage of uh, the sales of a product. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not yeah. intrinsically a bad way to do it. Yes. However, it does require publishers to make a profit. It does. Yeah. Royalties. So yeah. Yes. So you've got to be aware of the risks involved, and you can you can ask for an advance on royalties. Um, so royalties, there's a risk involved, um, and that risk when you take royalties, that royalties that risk is being passed partly onto you, the freelancer, rather than just the publisher. Then again, there's a chance that you might do very well out of it. If they have a sort of breakaway hit and suddenly, you know, make tens and tens of thousands of dollars off their Pathfinder supplement, you know. Which is what everyone wants. Um, they want to make money. certainly don't ever go into it expecting that to happen. So we could have a look at the types of contract then, because you brought that up a second ago. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the most common type of contract you'll find in the RPG industry, not necessarily in the wider industry, but in RPGs, is work for mm -hmm. hire. Hmm. What that means, if your contract says work for hire, it means that the publisher owns your output completely. Lock, stock, mm -hmm. and two smoking barrels, as it were. Right. So it's it's theirs. There's other options. They might have first publication, um, which means you retain ownership of the material, but the publisher gets to publish it first. For example, we use this... Um, I publish a few different magazines, like Insider, Trail Seeker, Eons and stuff, mm -hmm. Eons and stuff like that. Um, inside of okay, being yeah. the big sort of D&D um, &D fifth edition one. And our contract for that is a first publication contract. So what happens mm. when someone writes for us, they get paid, um, I think it's three or, f yeah, three cents a word, um, mm -hmm. but they get to keep copyright of their work, which increases the value yes. of that contract, which means because yes. three cents of the word is, it's not very high, but we're not, yeah. by, we're not, we're not getting work for higher stuff done. If it was work yeah, for hire not... and we owned it, we'd expect to pay higher. Yeah, yeah, because you're you get there's more value in it yes. for the author. So, so uh, three cents, it, three cents a word, first publication right. So uh, our contract says that you write an article for us. Yes, we get to publish it first. We get one year to publish it, 
Yeah. Uh, and then after that, oh. you can do what you want with it. You can publish it yourself, put it on your website, right. you can sell it to someone else, you can do whatever you want. It's yours, your material, do what you want, but we get a year is our, is our contract. Oh. So that's, that's first publication rights. Um, there's also sort of uh, non-exclusive licenses and things like that. So what you want to do is kind of balance the type of contract and the ownership with the amount you're being paid. So the more ownership you retain, the more reasonable a slightly lower rate of pay might be. There's um, there's one more type of contract which I think you really, really want to keep an eye out for. I mean, I would say don't do it. Okay, yeah. Pay on publication work. Oh, ho, so, ho, 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 yes. You, you should be paid for the work you've done when you've done it. Yes. So... You know, when I, it's completed, I, I, yeah. When pay on acceptance you've... is what you want, rather than pay on publication, yes. because you could you yes. could write a you know you could write a fifty thousand page book for somebody, fifty thousand yeah. pages. That's a lot of pages. Um, fifty thousand pa- fifty thousand word book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a bit better. That's Which is like, it's going to take you better. a lot of time. And if it's on pay on publication, yeah. that means that the yeah. uh, publisher can take it from you. Yeah. And just throw it away and you don't get paid or wait three years to publish it and then you don't get paid for three years. That's not fair. Yeah. You should be paid once that work has been accepted by the publisher. That's when you get paid. Yeah. Be careful. If, if Make sure. Yeah. Publication It's because the publisher doesn't have any cash to pay. Yeah. With. That's that's a bit of a worry because that also means they've got no cash to promote what they're doing. Mm. Well, I think yeah. one thing I mean, yeah, uh, pay on acceptance work, take pay on acceptance work, not pay on publication. Um, yeah. Be wary also of publishers that sort of like portray a policy of paying on acceptance as them doing you a favour. They're not doing you a favour. That's the baseline you should expect. If they're already starting to do that, you've got to think about, mm, they're being a little bit manipulative even at this stage. Mm-hmm. What's going to happen later? Yeah. So, you know, the baseline you should expect is pay on acceptance. Sometimes yeah. payment doesn't have to come instantly. I'd like oh. to sort of point that out. But you should be aware when it will come. Exactly where yes, it will come. Right. So, for example, uh, a company might do quarterly payments just because, depending yeah. on the size of the company, who knows? But um, uh, we at EM Publishing do monthly on the 15th of the month. Uh, I know some mm-hmm. other companies sort of might do their freelance payments out at a different periodical period. Just make sure you know when that is. It's not unreasonable yes, it for them to say it's going to be in two months or whatever, as long as it is in two months. Yeah, it's like they, you should expect because when you're not like on payroll, yeah. You should know it should be in your contract. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You know before you start work, you know when you're getting paid. Yeah, it's in the contract. Yeah, <laughs> it, so, it sounds really obvious, but it's one of those things that if you're used to the the world of more regular work, then you would just would be like, oh, do I have to sort that out myself? Mm-hmm. I assume they would just pay me. Yeah. No. Oh, one of the other things Find about um, working for exposure and stuff like that is audition work. Oh. Oh. Now, often a, often a publisher will want to see work that you've done before when deciding whether or not to hire you. Sort of like a portfolio. That's yeah. utterly reasonable. You can show them work yeah. you've already done before, not a problem, yeah. easy, makes yeah. sense. Sometimes they might ask you to do some work for them as a sort of audition. They might say, okay, let's see how this goes. Write an article for me and we'll see how that goes. Never do that for free. Your audition work has to be paid it's for work. as well. Yes. Whether or not yeah. they hire you after it is another matter. But And you yeah. can accept a slightly lower rate for the audition work, that's fine. But make sure you, yeah, don't do not do it for free. Other, other, okay. other little gotchas, tiny little things. If you Never. reuse open gaming content in your book, yes. don't expect to be paid for that. You're copying and pasting a stat block from the Pathfinder Bestiary. You don't get paid for that. If you're not sure how stat blocks are paid, because it's hard to divide those into words in, the, in an RPG thing, oh. uh, if it's not in the contract, ask. Make sure it's clarified. Yes. You might... With stat blocks, they might pay you by word and per stat block, for example, or something like that, because it's you know it's hard to quantify a stat block in terms of words. Yeah, yeah. Try not to work in exchange for products. That's not vastly different to working in exchange, <laughs> you know, for exposure. And um, you should get a yeah. copy of the product you've worked on anyway for free. Yeah. Don't don't accept that as your payment at all. No, no, that's. <laughs> and remember, it's okay if a company can't afford you. It's fine. That's all right. Yeah. The company can't afford to hire you. They can't afford to hire you. You need a compelling reason to... A worker is worthy of their heart, yeah. is what it all boils yeah. down to. I mean, yeah, there's, 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 things, be there's things in this world I can't afford, and, you know, I can't have them. They're artists. Um, artists. So, yeah, so we mentioned some pay rates oh, yeah. for um, writers earlier. So artists, yeah. pretty much the same thing applies. Um, don't work for yeah. exposure. Artists yeah. especially, even more so than writers, keeping hold of the copyright of your work is a yeah. valuable thing. 
Try and oh, do that because yeah. you can sell. Um, my friend Claudio Posas, who's um, yeah, uh, for example, he's done a whole bunch of work for me, all of which he's kept the rights to, and he sells prints of on his website. He's got this beautiful oh. picture of um, a dragon on a what a gold just a cover of an adventure I wrote a few years ago. Absolutely gorgeous. Uh-huh. It's his picture. Yeah, you know, it's on the cover of my book. He did it as a commission yeah. for me, but it's his. Yeah. He can sell it. He sells prints on his website. Uh, he was at Gen Con selling prints of it and keeping the rights to your artwork. Mike Schley, mm. who does a lot of the artwork, uh, the cartography for Wizards of the Coast, he sells prints of his oh, yeah. own sort of maps on his own website too. So that oh, fantastic. Try, try, try and get that as standard. Yes. Um, Keep, keeping copyright should be your baseline. Yeah. Really. I mean, again, like with the writing, it's not necessary always. I mean, if you're working for a sort of large company with strong IP, like if you're working for Star Wars, yeah. Yeah. you're not, you're not, you're not going to get to keep any of that, you know, but no, you know, yeah. you'll be paid, you'll be paid pay more. more. Yeah, that's the first thing. Don't work for exposure. See if you can keep copyright yeah. if you can. Fair rates for art, of course, um, is going to vary massively depending on who you're being employed by. Wizard of the Coast is yep. going to play you a lot more than, you know, a new PDF publisher starting on their first po- product. But you can expect Wizard of the Coast to be very definite about what you're drawing. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so yeah. And, they're, and, they're, a, well, and a well-known around. artist can charge, you know, <laughs> 10 times or more, more than a new one as well, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you've got a reputation and people know you're a stupid work. Um, yeah. So, for uh, sort of starting artists, I, I think sort of reasonable prices, and these are the prices I tend uh-huh. to see sort of in the industry, are sort of... $30 yeah. for a quarter page piece, $100 for a yeah. full page piece, assuming that's black and white. Yes, I was going to ask if colour... Right. Made so a, you're going to double it if it's in full colour. Right. So you, you can adjust these for non-work for higher stuff as well. So sort of avenues into freelancing. Okay, so there's a couple of ways to go about this. Uh, one way that I've seen successfully used is to start writing stuff yourself on a blog. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Get your name known out there. And um, once yeah. once your name is known, you can perhaps approach some sort of smaller publishers and ask for work. Now, one other great way is to start working for things like magazines or doing article-based stuff. I was going to ask, actually, what do you, what do you think of uh, Patreon? Big fan of Patreon because I use it a lot. I, uh, Insider is the magazine I publish, which has sort of 2,000-odd patrons. Mm-hmm. We produce uh, five articles or adventures, short adventures per month. Right. Uh, we've got you know we've got a nice sort of like system going there. We've got an editor, we've got I, artists. I literally had no idea you also did this. I knew about Ian World, obviously. I know about Ian Publishing, obviously. But Insider is something you've never mentioned in like what two years now. Ha. Huh. Well, okay. Well, I produce several magazines. Well, for Ian. So there's, yeah. there's Insider E N five I D E R. It's pronounced. It's spelled yeah, <laughs> Insider. Um, so there's that. Inside, which is the yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. fifth edition one, uh, which yeah, you can yeah. find at okay. patreon.com forward slash insider. So there's that. There's a Trail Seeker, which is the Pathfinder one. Okay. Uh, yeah. There's yeah. Eons, which is the What's Old is New one. Yes. I knew, I did know vaguely about that, yeah. actually. That you've reminded and, me. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's a, a brand new one for this very podcast. Without the Patreon, we wouldn't actually be able to do this because it's like building it all together. We've got, you know, we have Daryl's to pay. And like owl bears and like you know BB eights to buy all that sort of yeah. thing, right? And um, like this 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 high tech cadetry, which is letting me phone in from Edinburgh to yourself and still retain this crystal quality sound. And also, if people want to hear the outtakes and the things where we just talk about hilarious stuff, which in no way will fit inside this podcast. Hello everyone, your editor Daryl here. Speaking of Patreons, you may be wondering why there's a lot of topics not getting discussed like self-publishing, freelance cartography, the DMs Guild, how royalties and advances actually work, and a lot of other topics. Well, this discussion went very, very long and had to be edited down by almost half in order to fit into the show. But by the time you hear this, over at patreon.com slash Morris, exclusively for our backers, will be an over 35-minute discussion with more information about freelancing for role-playing games and how you can get your start creating games for a living. Or at least a part-time job, anyway. And that's addition to the normal deleted scenes with content that couldn't make it into the show, like Skype failures, con crud, Russ not understanding American holidays, and Peter falling in love with the boat, all available at patreon.com slash morris. 
Um, Just saying. So should, we, should we get back to the topic <laughs> at hand? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Freelancers, artists, yeah. writers, Patreons. Yes, do your Patreon, because yes. I was asking you about Patreons, because you were talking about okay. ways to build a sure. Yeah, I mean, so, obviously, you know, the topic we're on is freelancing rather than self-publishing. So, um, yes. looking at it more from the freelance point of view, um, you're looking yeah. at uh, working for someone else. Insider is actually an excellent, excellent way to get started. Because you start with oh. shortish articles, sort of a three to four mm-hmm. page articles. It gets paid uh, three cents a word. Uh, you get paid mm-hmm. on acceptance. Uh, yeah. You get to keep the copyright of your article. Useful. Although we do get yeah. a, a, a one year kind of a... Yeah, it's a one year window yeah. sort of thing. Uh, and um, yeah, and then your article gets sort of like edited illustrated and professionally published mm-hmm. up on Insider. Um, yeah, so uh, it's, a, it's a good way to get started. And also, there are people who've worked for Insider who are now working for Wizards of the Coast. There's people like James Intracasso and James Hayek who um, both have worked on the upcoming uh, Waterdeep products, for example. Right. They got their foot in the door. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. At yeah. Insider. Yeah. Um, other, other, other publishers that are great to still start working for is Cobalt Press are quite a good... Mm. I mean, they do, they've do. they got a decent pay rate. They're a good, ethical, well-known company. And they've got a solid product Yeah, exactly. Well. They're, you know, I, I, I always think, you know, they're, they're worth approaching. Another interesting mm. way to sort of approach things is to uh, go to Peso and maybe enter their RPG Superstar uh, contest every year. Oh, okay. Because yeah, quite, yeah. quite a lot of people who start, you know, who entered those contests end up writing as freelancers for Peso, for Pathfinder. It is a big talent competition. Yeah, yeah so, exactly. Yeah. Um, oh. yeah, otherwise you could uh, write for uh, websites, you could write columns for places like EN World. You know, there's, there's a million different ways to get your foot in the door. But basically the approach yeah. is start small and work your way up. Yeah, so if you wanted to work for Insider or Ian World, what's the best way to get in touch? Uh, so if you head over to uh, Insider, for example, there's a link at the bottom of the front page of the Patreon, which um, mm-hmm. gives you a link to the sort of submissions page, which gives you information about how to submit a pitch. How, how so that's patreon.com slash Insider. Yes. Yeah, and there's a link yeah, there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, yeah, and then essentially the process with that is you'll send a, a pitch to the editor of Insider, which is uh, the current mm-hmm. editor of Insider is Mike Myler. He will either sort of accept the pitch, not accept the pitch, mm-hmm. maybe talk the pitch over with you and accept a modified version of it or whatever. So okay, go, th- yeah. go through that process. Then you'll be given a contract, um, which mm-hmm. will have the word rate, deadline, all that sort of stuff on it. You'll rate your article, right. you'll send it to Mike, mm-hmm. he will accept it possibly ask you to alter it if it's awful yeah. maybe reject it but i think that's happened like literally once ever okay yeah, yeah. i mean to be fair if you if you're getting to the point of contracts and doing stuff then yeah. hopefully you'll i mean pre- presumably at that point he that may have seen some sample work of yours not Good not point. an audition piece i'll hasten to add he won't ask you to work no. for him for free <laughs> um but you know he might he may have seen some yeah. sample work of yours you've done in the past uh you'll then yeah. send in the uh, complete piece by the deadline, please. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll talk about deadlines in a second. Uh, and um, D- D- Douglas Adams, it was, who said, I love deadlines. They make a great whooshy noise. Exactly, yeah. But Douglas Adams <laughs> can do that. Nobody else can. Yeah, we'll talk about deadlines in a second. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, Michael, accept your piece, yeah. and then you'll get paid on the 15th yeah. of the following month, is how that works. Fantastic. Yeah, so that's really good turnaround. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what were we talking about? Deadlines, 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 deadlines. Yes. Now, Important things to hear. I've talked quite a lot about the responsibilities yeah. of a publisher towards a freelancer. Yes. Talk a little bit but, about the responsibilities of the freelancer. And the number yes. one responsibility as a freelancer is to do what you said you're going to do. You're only as good as your yeah. word. If, you, if the deadline comes by and the, and the publisher is chasing you, and they're getting nothing but static, or even worse, after the deadline has gone by, you give them a bunch of reasons why you haven't started yet. Don't, you know, because a publisher is relying on you. And when you say you're going to do it, you are saying you are available for this work and you will do this work in the time period allotted. You have to do that. Yeah. That is your obligation. Yeah, I mean, it's about promises. Yeah. It's ultimately, yeah. like, the publisher makes a promise, I will pay you if you do yeah. this work. You'll make a promise that saying, I'll do this work yes. by this For time. For example, if, if if the publisher didn't pay you on the date he said he was going to pay you, you'd be justifiably annoyed. Oh, but yeah. The, but the equal, the equal and opposite of that is 
you have to do the work by the date you said you do the work. Obviously, things do happen, but if you don't communicate... Exactly. Communication is key. You, even if you're like looking at it, you think, there's no way this is going to happen. Say, so, I'm really sorry. Yeah, sure. This is my and, plan you know, things, for doing Things it. happen. That's fine. Things yeah. happen. As long as you're not the person that something happens every single time... In which case, <laughs> con- you know, what's the common denominator here? <laughs> it's not the thing. Where, where is the common weakest yeah. link? <laughs> uh, but it, things happen. That's fine. You know, yeah. keep people in the loop. Let them know what's going on. Don't, yeah, you know, don't leave people hanging. Is the is the key there? So we've talked, we've talked a lot about free. This might be the topic we've talked well, most about so far. In fact. Would you like to play our favourite game in all the world? Uh, we'd almost got to the end of the podcast. I've forgotten about our favourite game in all the world. Russ, I am totally stoked. Our first ever long distance... Favourite game in all the world, all yes. The, world. the game would be where you read out the title of a Kickstarter and then I attempt to, from this title, guess yes, what it is. that is the game. Uh, I get points for this based on your um, entirely consistent... <laughs> And none of the yes, exactly. system. <laughs> it is a very, very complex point scoring system, and the number of spreadsheets involved is massive. That's we'll find out soon enough. Okay. What is Ancient Worlds Atisi? A T I S I. That sounds to me um, like Ancient Worlds is some sort of RPG system, and Atisi would be um, a location within it. And I'm going to have a punt that it's maybe like sort of a. African, pseudo-African setting. Yeah. Would you like to narrow down Africa? Oh, uh, not like Northern Africa. We're talking definitely Sub-Saharan. Um, like, yeah. I don't know. No. Do it is in fact. No. It's Egypt, in fact. Um, oh, okay. So um, this is uh, produced by um, a Brazilian chap called uh, Marcelo, Marcelo Pascalin. I don't know how you pronounce his name. But um, he's, he's Brazilian. It's a Bronze Age RPG setting for Dungeon World, inspired by Egyptian mythology. Interesting. Hmm, that is hmm. Fair enough. Oh, how many points <laughs> would I give you for that? I think um, three points out of 12. Okay. A solid 25%. <laughs> okay, the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. This is one of those ones where the first word is yes. the hard bit, and then it's got like a dash, and then... A sentence which basically explains what it is. So, do you want the full thing or do you want just the first word? <laughs> Let's try me on the first word. Right. So, the first word is woodfall, F A L L. Woodfall. Oh. Um, how about a modern day horror setting um, in the wilds of North America slash Canada? Hmm. Interesting. So, woodfall is a mini hex crawl setting, um, mm. it's a system neutral setting, dark mm-hmm. fantasy. Um, it's, uh, the theme is dark fairy tales, misty swamps, monster clans, strange towns of witches and thieves and forgotten treasure. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, um, probably more European. Yeah, it looks, yeah, it, look, it looks it to me, yeah, just in the artwork. Um, yeah. the artwork here, it's all sort of very sort of old school black and white. Oh. Uh, what's, what's the name of the, uh, system again? It's system, it's, uh, uh, so the setting is called Woodfall. Um, it's, 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 and the, and the, what's dash? Uh, a mini hex crawl setting. Right. Okay. So, I, to be fair, I wouldn't have gotten like dark fairies and fair stuff enough. like that. It's just like Woodfall's the name of the world. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, okay, but yeah. sounds interesting. I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. give you seven points out of eighteen for that. Fantastic. Thank you. Now, oh, I like the art on this one. Okay. Ooh, the next okay. one, Esoterica tabletop role playing game. What was it? Esoterica. How do you pronounce that word? How would I pronounce that word? Or how is that word correctly pronounced? <laughs> uh, two two entirely different questions. Esoteri- I'll say esoterica. If that's the right way, I'll take credit for it. If not, hey. I All right, let's go with e. Esoterica, <laughs> tabletop role-playing game. Esoterica. Um, well, esoteric is sort of like knowing all sorts of like randomly unrelated mm-hmm. things. So it's an RPG set about dealing with the random, unrelated nature of the world. Sort of a bit like a Dirk Gently's Holistic T- Detective Agency. Uh, we had the Ezo Terrorists, which was a game that sounded very strange, but very cool. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know, something mm-hmm. like that? Hmm. Or just miles mm-hmm. off. 
Um, so, um, <laughs> yeah, what we have here is, and uh, the artwork here is great. It's this guy standing, might be a lady, a person standing on what appears to be a sort of wooden, flimsy-ish wooden bridge held up by cables or something. Okay. And there's this giant skull and they're holding this torch up to it. And uh, this is I'm about... I'm guessing it's more of a fantasy. Oh, it's mystics, <laughs> magicians and occultists in the modern day world. Oh, okay, so it's modern day. Uh, all right, okay, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Esoterica is about action, conflict, and greed yeah. in a morally bankrupt world of modern occ- occ- modern occultism. O- occultism. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. On that we can agree. Yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you were you were in a million uh, miles away, I suppose. Uh, oh. I give you six points out of fourteen. That's <laughs> not I I I I'd like six points out. All of right 10. then, you can have six points out of ten instead. <laughs> Keep, keep point scores home, just adjust the scale. <laughs> okay, next one. The yeah. zombie world. Well, it sounds like a Powered by the Apocalypse clone, because they like their dungeon worlds, ancient worlds, etc. It's going to involve zombies, so I'm guessing it's a Powered by the Apocalypse a zombie survival horror RPG. 9.9 points out of 10. Um, zombie world is a card-based tabletop role-playing game. Survivors fighting against the living oh. and dead. But it has its roots in the powered by the apocalypse system, as you said, used by RPGs like Apocalypse World, Monster Hearts, and Masks, a new generation. Uh, But it takes that system in a few directions by using special cards to create characters, situations, and conflicts. Then that sounds very exciting. You did pretty well there. Pretty much spawn. It's a good name. What can I say? (laughs) Yeah. Okay, then. So we have two, two lovely reviews. People have said nice things about us. It's amazing, isn't it? People are the best. So we have a five-star review from Baffled and Wise, who says, Great to have a podcast featuring all the latest RPG news. Very handy way to keep up up to date. Fab compliment to the Grognard files. Is that how you pronounce that word? Grognard? Grognard? I I would say Grognard. It basically means like old grumbly soldier. So that's from uh, Baffled (laughs) and Wise over on um, iTunes. Thank you very much, Baffled and Wise. Do you think that's their actual name? I I would be surprised, but not massively. (laughs) All sorts of interesting names nowadays. I don't Um, judge. uh, The other review is uh, another five star review. This one is from (gasps) NK Pater1972. Fantastic. Uh, And uh, NK Pater1972 says. It's very tasty. It's very tasty, tastier than a filleted astral dreadnought. Well, as a connoisseur of filleted astral dreadnoughts, I happen to say that's a really high compliment. So, NK Pater 1972, thank you so much. So, the competition yeah. entries. We did get several entries last week. <sighs> what, was the, what was the fabulous prize that they're going to win? It was a digest copy of new. The science fiction role playing game. The science fiction role playing game using the What's Old is New setting, which is compatible with old and now. So if you wanted to. And indeed the upcoming Judge Dread role playing game. And the upcoming Judge mm. Dread role playing game. Is that something we can talk about? Um, uh, I want to know why we haven't been um, talking about it. <laughs> we will talk about it in quite a lot more detail very, very soon. We're just literally just waiting for some last bits and pieces and then. We'll have loads to talk about very soon. Fantastic. All aboard the Dread Train, uh, the 2000 AD train, because it's a lot more than just just Dread. But the contest, competition entries, we have five entries this year. The competition question, what was the RPG that Victor von Wolfhausen Smythe invented yes. for Queen Yes, Victoria? that is correct. So our... Um, and what was the correct so, answer? Um, well... Every one of these five people got the answer correctly, so I'll read out their entries. Um, so first yes. was our friend Tyler McConnell. Yep. Hey, Tyler. Hey, Tyler. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Uh, he says, Morris, Peter, and not Angus, as he's likely still at Gen Con. Uh, no, Tyler, he's not at Gen Con. He's at home asleep. Snoring. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's had a week off, and now he needs some time off to get over his time off. So... <laughs> <laughs> 
I hate that. So, serious <laughs> business joke, Tom. Yeah. yeah, I really hope to go next year. I was so jealous when he went this year. So anyway, uh, so uh, Tyler says, yes. uh, Dr. Victor von uh, Wolfhausen Smythe is uh, credited with creating Courts and Rapiers, a game of Elizabethan swashbuckling with dinosaurs, a favourite game of Queen Victoria. Indeed. You are correct, Tyler. That is exactly what the game was. Um, Carl White says... Queen Victoria had the pleasure of playing courts and rapiers, the game of Elizabethan swashbuckling and dinosaurs. You know, every time I read this out again, I want to play this game even more. It's got to happen. <laughs> um, whilst that does sound entertaining, I think I'd probably prefer to roleplay in the worlds of 2000 AD. Any snippets of information you can reveal yet on the upcoming Dread game? Yes, very, very soon, Carl, I promise. Really soon. Um, Mark Rosenthal is next. Mark Rosenthal says, hey, Russ, Peter, say. and yep. sometimes Angus, I love the podcast. I don't get to read nworld.org, okay? Um, so I turn to the podcast for my RPG news. A healthy dose of silliness is equally weapon. Weapon? Welcome. <laughs> um, Dr. Von Wolfhausen <laughs> Smythe wrote <laughs> Court and Rapiers, which he taught to Queen Victoria and had a rollicking good time playing it too. Keep up the great work and have Angus get some rest after Gen Con. Don't worry, Mark. Angus is doing exactly that. <laughs> Next is uh, Pune Hamzi. Hamzai. P P W O N E H is their first word. Is their first name H A M Z E I is their second name. Ooh, um, hey guys, I've been loving your show so far. It really broadened my view of RPGs. Before this, I basically thought D and D was one of its kind. Thanks and keep up the great work. The title of the role-playing game that Dr. Von Wolfhausen Smythe taught Queen Victoria was Courts and Rapiers. It also sounded like the game Elizabeth and Swashbuckling, but with one big difference. It had dinosaurs. Dinosaurs! Sorry, I have to shout dinosaurs. I just name, love this. You know Doctor Who, right? <laughs> Do you watch it? Do you yeah. know the uh, sort of um, Victorian trio... And one of them's a lizard. Do you do you remember them? <laughs> oh uh, yeah, I know what you're talking I, I forget, about. I, I forget what I they're called, but um, <laughs> yeah, this is kind of somehow makes me think of them a lot. I don't know why. Well, it sounds like we've got we sounds like we've got an RPG project ahead of us. Yeah, let's make this absolutely. happen. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so finally, we have. Hey, I think someone should do some fan art for us. That would be amazing. Uh, yeah. Fan art. Um, so Joshua Irving is our final yes. uh, competition entrant this week. Um, and he says, just got back from Gen Con. You lucky, lucky, lucky man, Joshua. I am very oh. jealous of you. Um, so this may be a bit but late. Not at all. You did send it yesterday, Joshua, so you're fine. Uh, the answer was courts and rapiers. Enjoying the podcast. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you very much, Joshua. Uh, we have five entrants. Should we uh, randomly determine the winner? Uh, I have here a, a D10. D10 rolling website in front okay, of me. Um, so if you would like to, if to make it fair, in your head, if you assign numbers to yep. each of them, and then I'll roll the D10 okay. and give the feedback. I'm just going to do them ready? in order, as I can see them on my page here. That seems fair. I have a nine. Okay. Well, that is Joshua Irvin. Joshua, the, the, the last one in the list. Uh, so, Joshua Irvin, you are the winner of this week's competition. I will send a copy of that book out to you. I will email you to get your mailing address. Well done. This week's competition, the prize is a digest copy of Now, the modern action role-playing game. And the question is this. Who did Dr. Wolfenhausen Smythe climb Mount Everest with? Please send your answers to morrispodcast at gmail.com. So thank you, everybody, for listening to our little podcast. We're very pleased with how it's going. It's getting more and more listeners every week and we're so happy about that and so grateful to you for listening Woo-hoo! this is me signing off for this week so until next week it's goodbye from me russ that's goodbye from me peter bye 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 bye